I wanted this up as I walked over, hopefully for some sense of irony. Um, Joan Robinson uh, is a, was a fairly famous economist. Some think she was probably the um, first. That's perfect. Okay. She should have probably been the first woman to uh, win a Nobel Prize. She didn't. Um, and what she said was, the purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made um, answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. I was given the um, topic, Perceiving Past the Paradigm, and I have to tell you, when I first heard it, I went, oh dear. Um, economists like paradigms. We like models. We like thinking in a framework where we can hang our hats and go, oh, okay, this is the lever, and that's what happens. And so when I thought about Perceiving Past the Paradigm, I decided to um, think about it the way I want to think about it. And the way I'm going to think about it is not jumping from model to model to model, saying, oh, forget that, forget that, let's start with something completely new. I'm viewing proceeding past the paradigm that you look at a model so deeply, you understand it so well, that when something is a matching reality, you know which assumption to challenge. And I'm going to talk about two economists who did that in the last hundred years. And when you challenge assumptions, even tiny ones with inside a model, it turns out it can have huge consequences for economies. And so I'm going to demonstrate how these two views have very different um, results when we take a look at the politics that occur around the world. I'm going to start with um, a fellow who definitely um, challenged the assumptions of his day, John Maynard Keynes. Now, John Maynard Keynes was actually a colleague of Joan Robinson, and he lived in a very tumultuous time. He lived through World War I, the Roaring Twenties, Great Depression, Second World War. And in the Great Depression, he looked around and said, something's not working. He said, we have this Great Depression, and all of our models say that um, free markets should be self-correcting. Uh, this shouldn't persist for very long. We shouldn't have unemployment at 20% lasting for so long. Something is wrong. And so what he decided to do, and he's often um, called the savior of capitalism, he decided, this is a time when communism was taking over the world, which is a very different paradigm of how you would um, economically live together and allocate scarce resources. It's are a very particular view of how we would allocate resources to who works, who does the job, what gets made. And he said, most of the free market seems to be working, except for one little part. And the one little part that doesn't seem to be working that well is the labor market. And he came up with what he called the general theory of employment interest in money. He wrote a it's a fairly famous book. It gets reduced to the general theory. And he was trying to say that, you know, there's some very good reasons why we can have persistent and prolonged unemployment that just isn't going to weigh in it, and it's going to be very grim. And so he um, introduced the idea that there wasn't enough demand, and so somebody had to go shopping, and you couldn't count on the business community to go shopping because they had their own issues that they were dealing with, and uncertainty makes you less confident and without confidence, you're not going to invest, you're not going to hire, you're not going to, um, even though if everybody hired, we could get out of this problem. No one person, no one business owner had the incentive to move first. And so there was a player who could do that. Guess who that player was? The government. He was the first to put onto the back of a government you are accountable for the state of unemployment inside your nation, and you can do something about it. You can go shopping. And then we see you know, the New Deal in, in the US, and coming up to the Second World War, which, as we heard earlier, uh, states that tax and spend, and especially if they go into conflict, they started to spend. And we saw that Keynesian economics kind of just happened. Uh, because we had World War II and economies grew and unemployment went down. And it looked like this was working really well. And basically all first world countries around the world had Keynesian economists who were telling their staff, 
If you want to get rid of unemployment, spend. Then something happened. It turns out that the Keynesian view is you should spend in bad times, but you should save in good times. But there is nothing so permanent as a temporary program. And so what happened was governments found that entitlement, people could not cut spending. And we were spending in good times, not just bad times. That became a problem. Also, how do you fund this spending? Well, you didn't want to keep raising taxes. That was viewed as uh, difficult, and not everybody wanted to have their taxes raised. And so a very simple solution to this problem is to say to your central bank, central bank, I want to print some bonds. I want to go into debt. I don't want to sell it to the public, because then it's going to have to raise interest rates and taxes to pay them back. I want to sell it to you. And when I sell it to you, you just put the money in my bank account and I go shopping. And next thing what you've done is what's called monetizing the debt. You have created tons of money that is paying for all these programs. But it's like a drug. You can get really addicted. What happened was money is what I call the grease to the real wheels. Money is what helps the real economy function smoothly. If you don't have enough, you grind to a halt. It's not a great world without money. It gets really tricky. Everybody, uh, you, it's difficult to have employment, it's difficult to feed yourself in worlds without money. But you don't want too much money. Then you've got slippage. The wheels are not connecting anymore. And we ended up with what's called stagflation. Stagnant economies, high inflation. And then when inflation gets really high, we call that hyperinflation. And we had countries around the world, like Latin America, South America, where inflation rates were 20% a month. Eastern Bloc countries, Russia, 1992, had an inflation rate of 1,000%, which means you can't count on money to work anymore. It's not safe. And so economies started to crumble, high unemployment. There's nothing that can cause a revolution so quick as having bread go up in price that people cannot afford to eat. And so at the end of it, suddenly they, we needed a paradigm shift. Keynesian economics wasn't working anymore. In came another famous economist, Milton Friedman. He had been a student of von Hayek. And he said, here's the deal. We have done the analysis, and I can tell you with absolute certainty that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. All right? It's always a monetary phenomenon. Here's the solution. You gotta stop printing money. You gotta cut the money supply. But that creates a problem for governments because they were using this money to fund their programs. So that means you've got to cut government spending. You've got to go into austerity. You've got to cut back. You've got to lay off people. You're going to have a lot of short-term pain. But in the end, if you can get rid of inflation and inflationary expectations, your economy has a chance of recovering. And because you're in a democratic society, you know, no one's going to put up with this for long. You've got to do it fast. And this became known as the shock doctrine. You have to do this quickly, or it will never happen, and you will not get a country out of a problem. The countries that did it, now today, are doing relatively well. But it's like any drug. You come off of a drug like money supply, and the next thing you know, you're going through the shakes. And it's awful. It was a huge human cost. So at the end of it, Keynes and Milton, Friedman, they, they basically saw the world with the same model. But you change the lever just slightly. You change what you think the underlying problem is just slightly. And now you have one government that is cutting spending and going for austerity, and another government that says we have to increase spending. And that world came back to us in 2009 when we went through the most recent economic downturn. Suddenly we were hearing our politicians say things like, okay, we need spending, stimulus spending. We need shovel-ready projects. You could not go through any town in Ontario in 2010 without hitting culverts that were being redone or new sewer systems being put in or arenas that were getting repainted. Even here at the University of Guelph, the Axel building uh, became the Alex building with new roofs, new extension. This had to be shovel-ready. We had to have it done by March or there'd be no money. All right, this was a Keynesian idea. The US, because it had more difficulties getting the spending up and 
up you know, to the bureaucracy are now starting to recover, and it looks like, and I just read in recent blogs by economists that this is the death of Keynesian because basically the free market is starting to recover because the government couldn't move fast enough. There's a huge debate about which side is true, and I guess what I just want to highlight is that we didn't need a new underlying model, but we do need to know the models really well, and we do need to know what the implications are, because the implications are really revolutionary. They totally change what your government does and how they operate. And I thought I would close. This is, you know, when people go to the streets, often it is about ideology, and it's often about economics. It's a really important issue. And so I want to close with this quote, because I think it's really uh, appropriate for Ted. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. I am sure that the power of vested interest is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. Thank you.